Hello, introductory astronomy class. It's good to see you again. Um, we are now going to record the lecture for the end of chapter 13. As you know, I like to get started with astronomy pictures of the day. I picked one from last month that's relevant to what we'll be talking about here today. This is the um, now called Clown Face Nebula, or NGC 2392. This is an example of a planetary nebula. And as you hopefully read about, and as you'll hear about today, uh, these planetary nebulae are created when uh, stars die. And these are low and intermediate mass stars that eject their outer layers into the surrounding to make planetary nebulae like this. And this particular planetary nebula was caused from the death of a sun-like star about 10,000 years ago. So that gives you the time scale over which these things form and die. It's rather quick in an astronomical sense. Uh, and this particular one is on the order of a third of a light year across. So rather big. Remember, the distance from the sun to the closest other, the, the next closest star is uh, a little more than four light years. And so this is a rather large spatial extent for the, uh, these nebulae. All right, so let's move on. And uh, as a review, last time we were in the middle of chapter 13. We had been discussing the evolution of low mass stars like our sun. And so just to review, the star like our sun would start on the main sequence. It goes across the subgiant branch and it leaves the main sequence after it's run out of hydrogen fuel in its core. And after going across the subgiant and then up the giant branch, it has this helium flash. And the helium flash is when you reach the temperature that's necessary for helium to fuse into carbon. And uh, despite the fact that fusion starts, it's not immediately that the star core expands and cools down. And so actually the fusion ends up skyrocketing. And in a matter of seconds, you pump a lot of energy into the star and then the star has to adjust and it will adjust down onto this horizontal branch on a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. And that's where we left it last time. We had helium fusing into carbon for these stars on the horizontal branch. And then the next thing will be what happens next, what happens when you run out of that helium fuel in the center of that helium burning star. So the idea here is that it is not quite hot enough yet for carbon to be fused from helium. So what instead happens is that helium continues to fuse in a shell around the inert carbon core. And then around that you have hydrogen fusing into helium. Here's the core of the star down in the lower left here. Once it has just started to leave and is leaving um, the horizontal branch. You've got the inert carbon core, you've got a helium burning shell around that, you have a hydrogen burning shell around that, and then there's lots of other gas in the star surrounding this core, but that's all inert. That is, it's not fusing, mostly hydrogen and helium gas. So this is called the double shell burning stage for good reason. There's two shells that are undergoing fusion. And this is the state of the star as it extends up what's called the asymptotic giant branch on the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. This state is not ever quite in a stable equilibrium. Instead, there are fusion spikes that occur where the fusion rate will jump up and then go back down. And the star goes through what are called thermal pulses and will eject some mass out into the surroundings, but without destroying the star altogether. Ultimately, these thermal pulses get large enough and you have one final one which does blow off the outer layers of the star and leave behind the core. Those outer layers that get blown off, that's what makes the planetary nebula like in the astronomy picture of the day that we looked at today. And the core that's left behind, that core is a white dwarf after that point. So these planetary nebulae have typical sizes of a light year or so. We saw that the clown faced nebula today was about a third of a light year across. The speeds of expansion are rather fast, 
30 kilometers per second. Remember, a 10 kilometer race is about six miles. So 30 kilometers per second is about 18 miles per second in the expansion rate. And they form and they dissipate on time scales on the order of 10,000 years, as we also uh, saw in today's astronomy picture of the day. So this is the Ring Nebula, a famous planetary nebula in the Lyra, the Harp constellation, which has a, a white dwarf in the middle. There's the Clown Face Nebula, the same one we saw in today's astronomy picture of the day. Uh, the Spirograph Nebula. And finally, the Hourglass Nebula. It has this interesting bimodal morphology associated with it. It makes you think that there must be some preferred axis along this gas was ejected. You can almost imagine the history of what has happened here. And that history likely involved the binary star system, more than one star, uh, to give it this kind of symmetry. But maybe that axis is perpendicular to the plane that those two stars were orbiting in. And when you have the uh, pulses, you can almost imagine like some mass was thrown up towards the top and as well as some mass being thrown off down towards the bottom to make this very interesting uh, shape. So that white dwarf that's left behind, that came from the core of the star. And that will never undergo fusion again if left in isolation. And that is, like the core before it, supported by electron degeneracy pressure. It doesn't get hot enough for fusion because that electron degeneracy pr pressure prevents the collapse of the star downward and prevents it, therefore, from getting um, hot enough, getting hot enough for fusion to be get to get even hotter. That is to say, these white dwarfs they will over time cool off and become more and more red and dimmer and dimmer as time goes on. And so here's a summary then of the evolutionary or life track of a sun-like star on the main sequence. Remember, the sun or stars like it will live for about 10 billion years on the main sequence. Lower mass stars live longer than that, higher mass stars shorter than that. And once it runs out of hydrogen fuel, it leaves the main sequence goes across the subgiant branch and up the red giant branch. When it was on the main sequence, it had a hydrogen burning shell. And then, of course, there's a lot of inert hydrogen and uh, I'm sorry, let me say that again. When it was on the main sequence, it had a hydrogen burning core. And of course, around that, you have a lot of inert hydrogen and helium gas. When it is uh, on the subgiant and giant branch, now you have an inert helium core because you've used up all the hydrogen gas. Around that, you have a hydrogen burning shell. And then around that, outside of the core, you have all that inert hydrogen and helium gas. You have the helium flash at the tip of the red giant branch, and it goes down to the helium burning stage on the horizontal branch. That's step three. And here we see that helium is now fusing into carbon in the core. Around that, you have hydrogen fusing into helium, and the inert gas surrounds that core. So you have a single shell here. And then once you run out of helium in the core, then it starts to go up the asymptotic giant branch. And with the help of this HR diagram, we can see why it's called the asymptotic giant branch. It runs parallel to and up toward parallel to the red giant branch and up towards that upper right corner of the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. On that asymptotic giant branch, the core will be in a double shell burning stage. Inert carbon in the center, that is no fusion of carbon to a heavier element, it doesn't get hot enough. Around that helium fusing into carbon, around that hydrogen fusing into helium, and then inert gas is all around the core. At the end of the asymptotic giant branch, you have that final thermal pulse that ejects the planetary nebula. And so that planetary nebula dissipates over tens of thousands of years and leaves behind that white dwarf star. White dwarfs are very small. We'll be talking about them in more detail later, but they're typically the size of the Earth, even though they may have the mass of the sun. And so these very dense objects don't have a lot of surface area from which light can be emitted. And that explains why, even though they can be hot, they have these low luminosities associated with them. 
Over time, those white dwarfs get dimmer and dimmer and dimmer as they radiate away their energy and they get cooler and cooler as well. So they move down and to the right on these Hertzsprung-Russell diagrams. So the sun and the earth will go through these stages, the sun will go through these stages we've been talking about and the earth will be a bystander orbiting around it as it happens. And so let's take a look at what the radius of the sun versus time is going to look like. Here, this line dropping downward is when the proto-sun was in the process of forming the sun. It collapses down to form um, something about 90% the radius that it currently has. Over the last four and a half billion years, the sun has been very gradually growing in its radius and it will continue to grow in its radius for the next approximately six billion years until it leaves the main sequence. And at that point, it'll start to get bigger, 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 and it'll take an additional one and a half-ish billion years for it to come up and reach the tip of the uh, red giant branch when it'll undergo the helium flash. Now look at what this size is this horizontal dashed line represents one astronomical unit, the orbital radius of the Earth around the Sun. And so the Sun will become as large as the Earth's orbital radius when it is uh, approaching helium flash. And so what will happen, if you could imagine that we'll be around or that there will be someone around to observe this, is that you'll see the Sun getting larger and larger and larger in the sky. As we'll discuss in a moment, it's also going to be getting brighter and brighter and the oceans will boil away and Earth will become this little cinder floating in space in orbit around the sun. The helium flash will occur and the sun will resettle down to something smaller, go through its thermal pulses and eject its outer layers into a planetary nebula. So approximately 8 billion years from now, um, or, or so, a little less than that, it will have uh, transformed into a planetary nebula. So in terms of the luminosity, here you have the contraction of your protostar. Here you have the brightening, the gradual brightening of the sun. And so you can see right now, four and a half billion years into its evolution, the sun is at one solar luminosity. In another seven, seven and a half billion years, it'll be uh, on the red giant branch having left the main sequence, and it'll be tens of times as bright as it is now. Then it'll become hundreds of times as bright, and then up to about 2,000 times as bright, as luminous as it is now when the helium flash occurs. And so, as I was mentioning before, not only uh, will the sun be getting bigger and bigger in the Earth's sky until it takes up essentially all of the sky as its outermost layers touch the Earth, they will be getting brighter and brighter as well. So if you want humans to be able to exist for billions of years into the future, you're going to need to eventually have them uh, populate the outer regions of the solar system, or colonize a nearby star system or something of the like. So here's a little interactive figure that allows us to uh, see what the stages of the sun will be like over time. We already looked at the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram for a sun-like star, but now we can play this. There's the sun, a typical star in our galaxy. And next it'll go after it leaves the main sequence in a hydrogen burning shell stage, that's the subgiant and red giant branches. Then uh, at the end of the red giant branch, it'll transition to become a helium burning star after that helium flash. And then after the helium burning stage, it'll go up the double shell burning stage as an asymptotic giant branch star. And then at the end of the double shell burning stage, 
um, you'll have the outer layers get blown off. So we zoomed out there so that you could see the gas expanding outwards uh, as the planetary nebula is created and the cooling white dwarf is left behind at its center. So the last slide that I want to show you for this chapter is a meme. Six billion years from now, when the sun turns into a red giant star and swallows Mercury, Venus, and possibly Earth, Pluto be like, who's not a planet now? <laughs> good, good astronomy humor right there. Ah, uh, yes. Well, sorry, Pluto, but you never should have been a planet in the first place. Moving onward. We will now, oh, not last slide for the chapter, but last slide for that section, because we still need to, in this chapter, talk about high mass stars and how they evolve. Now, remember, we defined last time as high mass stars being more massive than eight solar masses. And so the low mass stars were less than two solar masses. And the intermediate mass stars are going to share some characteristics of the low mass star evolution and some of the high mass star evolution. In all cases, the evolution starts out the same way. You have contraction of a gas cloud down to form a star on the main sequence. So that's step number one on the main sequence. Hydrogen fuses into helium. There's a different process by which predominantly the hydrogen becomes helium. You use what's called the carbon nitrogen oxygen cycle to make the helium, the carbon, the nitrogen, the oxygen, they act as catalysts in the conversion of hydrogen into helium. But still the effect is to destroy mass by making hydrogen into helium. When the high mass star leaves the uh, main sequence, it becomes not what we'll call a giant, but we'll call it a supergiant. In the supergiants, hydrogen is fusing into helium in a shell around a helium core. That helium core is inert, so it's analogous to red giants from the low mass star evolution. At the tip of the red giant branch, though, there won't be a helium flash because the degeneracy pressure is not, like in low mass stars, dominating over the thermal pressure. And so there is a more gradual transition then to step three, where you have helium core burning stars. So helium is fusing into carbon in the core. Hydrogen is fusing into helium in a shell around that, just like with the low mass stars. And you have the inert hydrogen and helium around the core. At the end of the helium burning core stage, then you start to go up again towards the upper right of a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. But unlike in the low mass star case where you make carbon and then you're done and then there's no additional heavier elements that are fused, in high mass stars there's enough gravity to pull inward to make it hot enough that you'll be able to go through a multiple shell burning stage. So you'll have more than just double shell. You have triple, quadruple, and onward and upward until ultimately in the innermost core, you generate iron. And iron, as we'll be discussing, is special. You can't get any energy out of fusing it or fissioning it. And so as a result, um, something different is going to happen. And what will happen is the star will explode in a supernova explosion, leaving behind a neutron star or a black hole, depending on the mass of the star that is being uh, destroyed. So let's walk through this a little more carefully and a little more slowly now. Starting with the Big Bang I've mentioned before generates 75% uh, hydrogen and 25% helium. Only trace amounts of heavier elements than that. So that's a long time ago, before the sun is born, 13.8 billion years ago. And the periodic table is rather boring then. You just got hydrogen and helium and only small amounts of other things. What happens next is that you have uh, stars. And stars will generate carbon through helium fusion. And so that's how you can start to generate some of these heavier elements. We're not going to talk, of course, about all the elements on the periodic table. There are channels to make all of them or at least those that aren't man-made uh, through natural processes. However, 
we will hit the highlights on how you make these elements. And that helium fusion is making for us carbon. In the high mass stars, you have the carbon nitrogen oxygen cycle that I mentioned. And you don't need to memorize the details of the steps here, right? Just appreciate that C and N and O are acting as catalysts. In step one, a hydrogen hits a carbon 12 to make a nitrogen 13 which decays to a carbon-13, which hits a hydrogen to make a nitrogen-14, which hits a hydrogen to make an oxygen-15, which decays to a nitrogen-15, which hits a hydrogen. And then that splits, that combination then will, uh, of the hydrogen and the nitrogen-15 makes a helium-4 and a carbon-12. That carbon-12 can be reused to initiate additional cycles but look at what happened. You had one hydrogen come in here, a second hydrogen come in here, a third hydrogen come in here, and a fourth hydrogen come in there, and you had one helium-4 come out. So four nucleons, all protons, came in, and four nucleons, two protons and two neutrons and a, and a helium nucleus, came out. Uh, but in the process, you therefore destroy mass because those four protons are more massive than one helium nucleus. And so the net effect is shown in the middle here. There's the four protons coming in. There's the helium nucleus coming out. You also get light rays and neutrinos and uh, positrons to get generated in the process. Positrons are antimatter electrons that will quickly find electrons to annihilate with and then release light energy. So you're making carbon and nitrogen and oxygen um, through stellar evolution. Now, what about heavier elements than that? A lot of elements are made through this process called helium capture. Here you have a carbon-12 and a helium-4 that combine together to make an oxygen-16. Here you have an oxygen-16 then and a helium-4 to make a neon-20, neon-20 and helium-4 to make magnesium-24. Look at what happens in each case. The number of protons in the heavier element that's, that's participating goes up by two. Carbon-12 has six protons and six neutrons. Its number of protons go up to eight protons. And the number of neutrons also go up by two, eight, eight neutrons. So basically, you, this carbon-12 has swallowed the helium-4 nucleus and made one bigger nucleus. And here you have eight and eight protons and neutrons. You pick up the two and two protons and neutrons to make 10 and 10 protons and neutrons, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And notice that what I'm showing you here has a lot of even numbers in it. Eight protons, 10 protons, 12 protons. And it's because of that that you do see relative abundances of the even numbered elements on the periodic tables higher than their odd numbered neighbors. So for example, here's carbon 12, or carbon, the, the sixth element on the periodic table. Um, here is nitrogen, here is oxygen, and so on and so forth. You see how the relative abundance kind of goes up, down, up, down, uh, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. That's because of this helium capture. It's easier to make even numbered elements on the periodic table. So that's evidence right there that our ideas about star formation are on the right track because we predict from our understanding of stars that you should have more uh, higher abundance, that is, uh, even numbered elements. So through things like helium capture, we're making neon and magnesium on the periodic table. And in the post uh, high horizontal branch evolution of these high mass stars, we're gonna keep on going after you've uh, made neon and magnesium, you can make heavier elements still. So there are lots of different reactions that can take place. We're showing you here only a few of them, but like carbon and oxygen can fuse to silicon and oxygen and oxygen to sulfur and silicon and silicon to iron. And iron here is a special element on the periodic table. Stars more massive than about eight solar masses can, through fusion reactions, make things all the way up to iron. Iron is special 
because it has the lowest mass per nucleon. And so if you imagine trying to add nucleons to iron through some fusion reaction, it has more mass per nucleon than it did before. Or if you fission it, it'll have more mass per nucleon than it did before. Either way, you're not going to be destroying matter by either fusing or fissioning iron. Iron is the excrement of stars. You know, we eat food, we make use of the energy inside of that, the, that food, and then we expel it from our bodies. And in a sense, that's what stars are doing. Their food, so to speak, are the elements of nature. And they are getting the energy that they can out of those elements until they get to iron and nothing more can be done at that point. There's no energy that you can get out of iron. This graph on the vertical axis shows you the mass per nuclear particle per nucleon. On the horizontal axis, it's showing you the atomic mass. Remember, that's the number of protons and neutrons in the nucleus. So as the high mass star is going up that asymptotic giant branch after the horizontal branch, right, no longer simply fusing helium in its core, it's going to have the chance to go through these multiple shell burnings. And so you don't need to memorize the orders of these but just appreciate that uh, you have a lot of inert hydrogen and helium gas surrounding the core. And then in the core where the fusion is going on, you have hydrogen fusing into helium, then helium fusing into carbon, then carbon fusing into other things, oxygen, neon, magnesium, silicon, as you go deeper and deeper until ultimately um, at the end of it all, you'll have the inert iron core. Here's a little interactive figure that'll help us to ex uh, explain these processes. And it's worth pointing out here that the same electron degeneracy pressure that we've been talking about that supports stars in their cores, that's what's supporting the stars and the cores of these high mass stars as well. And so that degeneracy pressure is slowing the compression, but it's, in the case of high mass stars, not able to win. The mass of the star itself and the gravity associated with it is ultimately going to be able to overcome the degeneracy pressure. And so let's go ahead and uh, pick this up at a double shell burning stage of a high mass star and watch how it plays out. Here, you've run out of helium fuel in the core of the star, so you have the inert carbon core. Helium is still fusing to carbon in a shell around that. Hydrogen is fusing into helium in a shell around that. And then the bulk of the star, by volume and by mass, is inert hydrogen and helium gas. This is just the core up here. Here we zoom out and see the whole star. So let's go ahead and begin ignition of carbon. It gets hot enough. And so carbon is fusing into oxygen, and then oxygen is going to quick, quickly become hot enough to fuse as well. And so the oxygen will fuse into neon, the neon will fuse into magnesium, the magnesium fuses into silicon, the silicon fuses into iron. And so at this stage, we have an inert iron core. And you cannot, as we said, get any additional energy out of the iron. And so something different is going to happen now. Let's go ahead and uh, play it forward and watch the death of this high mass star. Warning, danger, fusion of iron will not give off energy. And bam, you have an explosion. Why? We're going to talk about the details of why. But that is the effect of the, uh, of the end of this stellar evolution. So let's go ahead and look at what was created. You make what's called a supernova remnant. Here's an example of one of these supernova remnants. And you leave behind at the center either a neutron star or a black hole. These are corpses of stars. 
They're even more dense than white dwarfs that we'll be discussing in more detail in the next chapter. So why is it that you get that supernova explosion? Well, what happens is that that great pressure from gravity pushing inward can't be supported by the electron degeneracy pressure. And it becomes energetically favorable for the electrons to merge with protons and make neutrons and neutrinos. Notice that charge is conserved in this process. An electron is negative, a proton is positive. Neutrons and neutrinos are negative. So overall, you start with something that's neutral and you end with something that's neutral. You also conserve nucleon number. A proton's a nucleon, a, a neutron's a nucleon. So you have one coming in and one coming out. But in this process, you've destroyed all these electrons as they're transformed with the help of the protons into neutrons and neutrinos. And so you remove the electron degeneracy pressure in the core of that star. That was the pressure that had been battling off the gravity. And when you remove that electron degeneracy pressure, now the gravity can just take over. There's still a small amount of neutron degeneracy pressure but it's much weaker than the electron degeneracy pressure because neutrons are more massive and they move around more slowly and so they can't give as much pressure outward. So this gravity causes the star to implode. Now I said a moment ago that you have a supernova explosion and now I'm saying you have an implosion, a contraction, a compression of the center. Well, yes, that's right. The core is compressing inward. And as we'll discuss in a moment, it's going to rebound and then bounce and push the outer layers outward. During this very energetic process, you uh, generate elements that are heavier than iron on the periodic table. Although I said that you can't get energy out when you're um, fusing iron with other things to make heavier elements, you can fuse iron with other things. It's just that you have to put energy in to make it happen. And there's a lot of energy available during this energetic supernova explosion. And so that's how you get elements heavier than iron on the periodic table. Things like gold, for example, in my wedding band. This gold here, it was either made in a supernova explosion or it was made in a collision between neutron stars. Either way, it was some kind of celestial astronomical event which made those elements that we see around us um, heavier than iron on the periodic table. And for those elements not as heavy as iron on the periodic table, they were forged in stars as well, with the exception, of course, of hydrogen and helium and in very rare circumstances, uh, lithium and some other elements. So, fine, um, this supernova is a very powerful event. The supernova remnant that we're looking at here is the Crab Nebula. It was actually observed by Chinese astronomers back in 1054 AD. They have uh, written records of it. And the, we therefore know how long ago this remnant formed. So for the last nearly thousand years, the gas in the supernova has been expanding outwards. This has been slowly beginning, uh, has been slowly getting larger and larger and larger. Now I have a demonstration device. I wish you were in the planetarium with me right now so that we could show you how it works. This is the Astro Blaster. This was given to me uh, as a gift several years ago after I helped out at a particular workshop. And it says here that it works like a real supernova. <laughs> Even gives you the safety goggles. Ages 11 and up because you wouldn't want a 10 year old to play with something that works like a real supernova. Although I can't demonstrate it for you, I did go online and find some uh, YouTube videos that we can use to help explain this process. Um, this first video is showing just simply a ball that's bouncing. And think about this as being analogous to the core of a star as it is collapsing inward. It's collapsing inward and it's going to shoot past equilibrium. You see how the ball becomes deformed? It doesn't maintain its spherical shape, right? 
the spherical shape is its equilibrium. And as it hits the ground here, it's compressed. And that compression then pushes back on the ball and causes it to rebound upward. And the same kind of thing will happen here with our high mass stars. The cores of them are falling inward on themselves and they will shoot past their equilibrium and then rebound and go outward. So, okay, um, fine. It's even cooler than that in a sense. Here, if you imagine, like in supernovae, that one ball is, uh, that one layer is packed on top of the other, you can drive those outer layers up very quickly and, uh, ver and to very great distances by having them be pushed on by the inner layers. So there you can imagine that that tennis ball and that um, basketball are different layers within the supernova. And the core of the supernova, the innermost portion of the core is being represented by the basketball. And then as you work your way outward to surrounding layers, those would be represented by this tennis ball here. And I can go ahead and um, play this at a slower speed so we can get a better look at this. Slightly slower speed. And so there, momentum and energy is transferred from that, from that um, inner region to the outer region. Let me actually go to this next stage. It's from the same video, but now we've gone ahead and we've stacked three balls on top of themselves. And you can imagine how energy is transferred from the innermost layer to the medium layer to the uppermost layer, and then bam, that outermost layer goes flying off like in a supernova explosion. Oh, she's comparing it to supernovae as well. So let's go ahead and, and show you the Astro Blaster. It is much more fun done in the planetarium. There's something nice about the possibility that one of us will get struck in the eye by this little ball here. But nevertheless, we'll take the safety of watching this on YouTube as a replacement and here we go, I've uh, moved this into slow-mo. And so there are one, two, three, four balls that are connected along uh, a little plastic tube. And then if you watch carefully, you'll be able to see the ball go flying off to the side here. Um, there it goes, we'll try one more time. You'll be able to see that topmost ball go flying off to the side. Whoop, there it went. So what's going on there is the same kind of thing conceptually as what goes on in supernovae. You have all these layers collapsing inward, rebounding, going outward, and those low density regions in the outside with a lot of not, not a lot of mass per unit volume, they pick up a lot of speed as a result. And that's what causes the uh, explosion and the supernova uh, remnant as a result. So in summary, it's going to be the mass of the star that determines what happens to it as it evolves. The low mass stars are going to end their lives by making carbon in their cores and they're not going to have these supernovae explosions that we just talked about. Instead, they'll make a planetary nebula and white dwarfs. Uh, the high mass stars, they go through their stages of evolution much more quickly because uh, those, those um, stronger gravitational forces make everything happen much more quickly. It's kind of analogous to uh, going to a casino. And if I go to a casino with 20 bucks in my pocket, I might, you know, sit there and... Um, get some free Coca-Cola drinks and play the quarter slots and uh, stay there the whole day, uh, losing my $20 by the end of the day. But then some multimillionaire comes in with a $100,000 bankroll and she's putting down, um, they're putting down $100 bets, $1,000 bets, $10,000 bets, and they're out of there 30 minutes later. Even though they had a larger bankroll, 
they burn through it so much more quickly that the time they spent was much less than the fugal, frugal patron. And so the idea here with stars is that even though the mass of stars have a lot more fuel that's available to them, they burn through it so much more quickly. Their fusion rates while they're on the main sequence are so much higher that they burn through that extra fuel, they become super giants, they blow up, and they can do that for the most massive of stars in just a few million years, whereas the lower mass stars take much longer to go through all of these stages. So not only do low and high mass stars end up in different places, they'll take a different amount of time to go through their stages as well. The intermediate mass stars between two and eight solar masses, um, they share characteristics of both the low and high mass stars. They are more like the, the low mass stars in the sense that they will make planetary nebulae and white dwarfs. They may end up making a little bit of oxygen. They don't necessarily end right at carbon, but they won't go through that multiple shell burning stage all the way up to iron. Like the high mass stars, the inter intermediate mass stars will not have a helium flash. Instead, the helium fusion will turn on gradually. Now, the last section of chapter 13 is on binary star systems. Single star evolution is understood extraordinarily well. Binary star evolution is trickier because you can have interactions between the stars, especially in close binary systems. And so here's a thought question for you. Um, there is a binary star system, Algol, which is a 3.7 solar mass main sequence star and a 0.8 solar mass subgiant star. So there's the subgiant being represented. There's the main sequence star. And you can see that the subgiant has expanded and uh, overflowed what's called its Roche lobe, so that matter can now stream down onto its companion, the 0.8 solar mass, I mean, sorry, the 3.7 solar mass main sequence star. And what's strange about this pairing? If you want to pause about it and think about it, see if you can predict what I'm about to say, uh, go ahead and do so. What's strange about this is you would, you would say, okay, well, it's reasonable to expect that these two stars were born at about the same time. And it's highly unlikely that you could have them born separately from different gas clouds, and then they got lucky enough to be captured somehow and then put in an orbit. I suppose it's possible but it's much more easy to explain that the two stars were born together. And if they're born together though, the more massive star, the 3.7 solar mass star, you would think naively that it should have gone on to its later stages of evolution before the 0.8 solar mass star did. But this is the opposite way around. That's why it's strange. The lower mass star is in a later state. It's a subgiant already. Whereas the higher mass star is still back on the main sequence. So how is it that a system like this came about? Well, what you can imagine is a sequence of events like these, where you have a, um, two main sequence stars in orbit around one another. One of them, the one on the left here, is more massive. This is the one that will ultimately be the less massive star. But in the beginning, it's the more massive star. And it started to leave the main sequence to become a, a subgiant. And when it did, it transferred matter over to the lower mass companion. So this guy was lower mass, not really going through its hydrogen fuel very quickly at all. And then after this guy left the main sequence, mass was transferred over to the lower mass star. And then they switched roles in terms of which one was most massive. Once enough mass was transferred over, the star on the right here was actually the more massive one. It's still on the main sequence because for so long it had been fusing hydrogen into helium at a slow rate. It didn't go through all of its hydrogen yet. And so here we're left with a massive main sequence star. And this red giant star doesn't have as much mass anymore. The lower, now lower mass star is a, a, a red giant. So that's how scenarios like that could come about. The answer to today's reading quiz question is going to be Arc to Arcturus. 
if you write Art to Arcturus, you will get credit for the reading quiz question. And in the final few minutes, I'm going to review with you the constellations that you're learning about for the next exam. Feel free to pause this as necessary if you need to um, give yourself a moment to see if you can remember these. But what is the constellation that is between Gemini the twins, which by the way is where you can find the clown face nebula, and Leo the lion? What constellation is between Gemini and Leo? It is Cancer the Crab. And in Cancer the Crab, there's the Beehive Star Cluster. Do you remember if it's an open cluster or a globular cluster? It's an open cluster. It has about a thousand stars in it. Globular clusters have hundreds of thousands of stars in them typically. Open clusters are not quite as densely packed as globular clusters. And you can see the globular cluster, I'm sorry, the open cluster of the Beehive as a little smear of light in the sky, even with the naked eye. Under binoculars, it looks even more beautiful. Okay, this is Bella's favorite constellation. There it is, Leo the Lion. And do you remember what the name of this star in Leo the Lion is? This star is Regulus. And in the back end of the lion, we have Denebola. So when you're looking for Leo, look for this backward question mark punctuated by Regulus, and then there's a triangle in the back end with Denebola. All right, now the answer to today's reading quiz, Arc 2, yes, Arcturus. Arc to Arcturus in the Boötes the Herdsman constellation. And then you spike down to Spica in the Virgo the Virgin constellation. So there's Arcturus in Boötes the Herdsman. And if you're looking for Boötes, you kind of look for this kite-shaped region. Here it kind of looks like a diagonal, I'm sorry, a, um, a diamond-shaped kite. This side of the kite is dented in a little bit here. And you can think of this as a tail of the kite. Or there's the head of Boötes and the shoulders, the narrowing waistline, and the two little legs. And then there's Spica. What did we say the constellation Spica was in? Virgo the Virgin. And when you're looking for Virgo, the easiest thing to do is to find Leo the Lion. You'll presumably be in the northern hemisphere facing the south. And Denebola will be the leftmost star on Leo the Lion. And when you find that, just go a little more left and a little bit down. There's the head of Virgo the Virgin. And then her one arm is coming up this way. Here's her back, one of her legs, and here's another one of her legs and her arm. Or if you like, you can think about that as being her head again and her arm, and then um, her legs don't start until further off to the left. So that's all for today. Bella and I hope that you are doing well. Uh, stay safe and take care.